Thanks for listening to Gossip with Celebrity, brought to you by Celebrity.com. This week, we talk about the Royals and Ben Affleck. We also cover our favorite stories of the year. We end with our weekly feature, the comments of the week. The stories, photos, and tweets we talk about can be found at Celebrity.com slash podcast under episode 111. Hi, I'm Katie, the founder. I'm going to say it again because I knocked this thing down and it made a noise. I heard this thing fall. Hi, I'm Katie, the founder and editor of Celebrity.com, and I write a Celebrity. And I'm Chandra. I write as Kaiser. I'm the head writer for Celebrity. I messed mine so up. So this <laughs> okay. This is our last episode of the year. So we'll be back on January 8th. We're taking two weeks off for the holidays. Do you disagree with that? <laughs> <laughs> I looked at the calendar. We're not going to fight about it. Okay. I, yeah, I looked at all the stuff that you put in for the award shows. I cannot believe the Grammys are on a Monday next year. That is I know. stupid and insane. Whatever. Yeah. We don't have to watch them all. We never do anyway. <laughs> We're getting old. Our audience is getting old. They don't care. You know, it's like, who? Like, a lot of these people. Yeah. And what's weird is that even the MTV awards are like that now. The VMAs. I feel like most people just don't even pay attention. No, it's kind of over now. But also, like, I think award shows are fading because of the pandemic. Now they're trying to bring them back. And I don't know. It just doesn't feel the same. Well, it'll be interesting to see the Oscars pushed back again to March. I think that will be interesting because everything about the award season has been stupidly compressed in recent years. Yeah, they're really too close together, but... Yeah, like, I remember when we were, like, in college and stuff like that, the Oscars were always in March, and they were always a huge event, and they were always so glamorous. And that was the last one, the last big thing. Yeah. So we'll see. So I saw this great documentary. I wanted to talk about it. It's called 14 Peaks on Netflix. And it's about this Nepalese climber named Nims Persia. And he's former UK Special Forces. And in 2019, he climbed all 14 of the world's highest mountains in under seven months, which is this amazing feat of mountaineering. So before that, the record was eight years for someone to do all those things. So it was just a fascinating documentary. And and he's just really low key about it, too. He was not braggy or anything. And I hadn't even heard of him before now. So I saw this and I was so impressed. I wanted to recommend that. I think it might win best documentary at the Oscars. I would like to see him at the Oscars, too. That sounds cool. I watched The Truffle Hunters. I watched that recently. Oh, and that was very good. It was all about these really old Italian men who are truffle hunters. And they go out with their dogs. And basically, it's about the dying art, that there are not young people who are excited about truffle hunting. It's just these very (laughs) weird old men. And they just live to spend time with their dogs outdoors. And... (laughs) It was really sweet, especially all this stuff about the dogs, how they treat their dogs. It was great. What is it on? Do you remember what service it's on? I think I rented it from Vudu, and it was real cheap. Okay. All right. I'll see if I can find it. It sounds sweet. So I saw you wrote that you watched The Power of the Dog. What did you think of that one? Yeah. I started watching it a few weeks ago, like when it first came out, and I had to stop it because Benedict Cumberbatch's character... He gets very angry at his brother and he starts being violent with a horse. And I was like, ooh, I cannot finish this. If that's what the movie is going to be about, I cannot do this. But everyone was like, no, it's a really good movie. I did pick it up again. And it was. It got a lot better from that point. Okay. Benedict was very good. I understand why he's getting nominated for everything. I understand why the movie is getting Best Picture nominations. And that the young actor Cody Smith McPhee, I guess that's how you say his name. Yeah. He's very good. He stole most of his scenes away from Benedict. I didn't think Kirsten Dunst did much in the movie. I don't understand her nominations. All she did was just kind of simper and then drink. (laughs) I saw Jesse Plemons on one of the 
talk shows and he said how awesome it was not to have to be the villain for once (laughs) just be married to kirsten on screen was nice he said he's great in it they have a lot of chemistry together not that they really got to show that off you know it's not really about them yeah i actually believed jesse and benedict as brothers i thought that they had a very brotherly dynamic okay i'll have to watch it it'll probably get nominated for some stuff And Jane Campion, I mean, I love her movies. She knows how to shoot a movie. And it was, it's just beautiful. The the movie is very beautiful. You can tell that it's not set, it's not actually Montana, though. You can tell it's like, oh, that looks like New Zealand. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right, let's talk about the Royals. So we don't have a lot of Royals news this week, and we'll go pretty fast because we want to do our favorite stories of the year as well. But Duchess Kate is one of two People Magazine covers this week. The other one is sadly about Nick Cannon losing his five-month-old son, Zen. But Kate's cover profile is one of those embiggening pieces. We always read about her. It's pretty ridiculous. We don't have to get into that. (laughs) I guess she's 40, and they talk about her great new style. Yeah, she'll be 40 next month. And... Yeah, it was just like, oh, she's flourishing. She's truly a professional woman. No, she's not. I mean, maybe she's as good as you could get in the Royals. <laughs> no, seriously. She's as good as you can get while meeting their expectations. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, she did exactly what she's supposed to do, which is not a lot. You know, we always have this debate of, could she do more? I mean, obviously, she could do a lot more. But if yeah. she did a lot more, would she piss people off? Within the family. Surely. Yeah. I think she would. And William would be pissed at her if she was outshining him constantly. And he did try to clip her wings a few times, (laughs) telling her not to do stuff, and she dutifully didn't. Yeah, she threw a fit when he told her she couldn't come to the statue unveiling back in July. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that was a big thing. Yeah, she threw a fit about that for a month. (laughs) He told her to stay home. (laughs) Well, it turned out fine between him and William, and he didn't want those headlines again where she's the one brokering the peace, Uh like at Philip's funeral, (laughs) because she made sure to insert herself into that. Yep, she was the peacemaker, the kingmaker. So I wanted to talk about the comments about her style from a British royal commenter named Tessa Dunlop, and she was talking about Kate's matronly style and how it suits her now and she was using that phrase mutton dressed as a lamb but the opposite way because kate was young dressing old and now i guess she grew into it or something Mm -hmm. and it was kind of backhanded praise oh yeah it was great (laughs) i transcribed it from the male confidential or palace confidential i put the little video in there she was so bitchy but she played it off very well. Oh, I should watch it. <laughs> I think for about 10 years, she styled herself as older than she is. And now she's entered her fifth decade. It's like, wow, she is rocking that look. And Kate, rather than us thinking, oh, the flower of her youth has diminished. It's almost like she's growing into her look and her role. Yeah, I mean, I suppose if you're a bitchy tabloid, you might say that for years and years, she was lamb dressed as mutton. And now mutton is where it's at. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually agree with that. I think that especially in the early years, Kate would dress way too young. She was in her 30s and she was still wearing little twirly skirts and dressing like a college girl. Yeah. Then she would overcorrect and go way too matronly and try to dress like the queen. And she never got that balance where she looked Like business professional. Yeah. And not until Megan came around. (laughs) When she copied some of her outfits. Yeah. Like almost note for note. (laughs) Even then, Kate always gets something wrong. Even when she's like trying to copy Megan or copy Princess Mary. I was looking through photos of Princess Mary and I was like, holy shit, Kate has been copying her this whole time. Oh, okay. I would be interested in more of those. (laughs) Kate always gets it a little bit wrong. Like she gets the hemline wrong or she gets the blouse wrong. But that is progress for her. (laughs) Too many buttons, too many pussy bows. So we talked about this on Zoom and this is Courtney, Karen, April, and Aida. Well, I had to make copies of my final exam. I was like, I really hope I don't miss them talking about how Kate is like mutton. I read that article twice and I'm like, these are all like backhanded compliments. 
I missed it. What's going on? No, they were just saying, you know, she's entering her fifth decade. I'm like, what the hell are you talking oh, about? Oh, because she's turning 40. That's right. Somebody on Twitter was like, that is the most accurate and shady thing ever. Because obviously, yes, your 40s are your fifth decade because zero to nine <laughs> is your first decade. But like, she just called her 50. She's finally yeah. dressing like an old maid. This is not a compliment. <laughs> so Aida's new. She's one of the people who heard our message like a couple of weeks ago did they want to sign up for the zoom so she did so hi to her and she's kind of far so she it was like midnight her time when she talked to us but that was nice that's cute yeah yeah it is shady like karen was saying it was great though i mean it's better than just she never puts a foot wrong she always looks perfect she never looks perfect no and that's not what i want from her I don't want her to look perfect. I want her to look interesting. I want her to look professional. and But the palace doesn't want her to be interesting at all. So that's what I was saying earlier. I think she's doing her job by just <laughs> diminishing herself. I don't think the palace is happy that she like cosplays flags and <laughs> <laughs> is this a fan of literal dressing. <laughs> Always wears tartan when she's in scotland you know <laughs> yeah she's kind of ridiculous that way all right let's talk about ben affleck so affleck is promoting this movie on amazon prime coming out on amazon prime called the tender bar and it's directed by george clooney it's a coming of age movie based on a memoir by J.R. moringer And Ben is like a father figure uncle who's a bartender and kind of helps raise his nephew. And he's been nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actor. And he did an interview with Howard Stern where he really put his foot into it. He said that if he stayed with Jennifer Garner, quote, we probably would have ended up at each other's throats. I probably still would have been drinking. Part of why I started drinking was because I was trapped. He was like, I can't leave because of my kids, but I'm not happy. What do I do? And what I did was I I drank a bottle of scotch and fell asleep on the couch. So he really said all those things. Like what we did and what other outlets did is just take his quotes and cut and paste them word for word what he said. Right. Of course, there was added context. And I said that in the original post. I was like, this is part of a much longer interview. And he talks about a lot of different things. And yes, there was stuff leading up to these quotes but he still said that shit he still said that he would still be drinking if he was with jennifer garner how many years has he he been in the industry now he knows how to give an interview yeah he knows how his quotes are going to be taken and he knows what to say instead he went on kimmel and he tried to claim he was misquoted and it was clickbait taken out of context and the fucked up thing is he was not sober on kimmel yeah I mean, I felt bad. He wasn't for... wasted, but he was <laughs> mumbly. I felt bad for noting that because it made me uncomfortable to watch him because there was something wrong with his speech patterns. He couldn't open his eyes fully. And when you could see his eyes, they looked red. I think he was just baked. Maybe he brought a bong with him or something. I think they vape or they take gummies or whatever. Or he could have been on pills. Yeah. And. When he and Jennifer, Jennifer Lopez, when they were in Venice, I thought he looked baked then. He looked high at the premiere. He looked just kind of a little bit out of it, just kind of relaxed, almost pharmaceutically relaxed. You can tell he was mumbly and struggling with his words. On the Kimmel interview? Yeah. In the Kimmel interview. And he wasn't sober. That's not sober. (laughs) If you're high or whatever, it's not sober. You're high. California sober. <laughs> what Demi Lovato said. Mm-hmm. Although <laughs> when Demi, Demi said it. sober now. Like, yeah. yeah. When Demi said it, everybody yelled at them because Demi deserved it. <laughs> you know, it's not cool. <laughs> well, Demi was still drinking and getting high and doing other things. Their probably. problem was taking pills, I think. And because their problem was different, Demi was like, oh, it's no big deal. But. It is. You have to. I don't know if I agree with AA tenets that you have to not have anything. Like if your problem is. Yeah, I've heard that before that like someone who is a heroin addict can have a beer. It doesn't really affect them. And it's not like an addiction issue for them. 
if their problem was heroin. That's how I am with taking opiates. I can take pain pills and I don't get addicted to pain pills, but I can't drink. Yeah. And I heard that from the opiate addicts in AA because we didn't have an NA in my town. So they would come to our meetings and they would say that drinking is not their issue. Yeah. You know, but... But yeah, it's different when it's your job. to. <laughs> I think Ben just has a really addictive personality. Yeah. And I think they're just red flags jumping up all over the place right now for Ben. I wrote that he gets itchy when things start going too well for him. And it's true. Things are going really well for him. He's in the middle of what will be a big Oscar campaign for the tender bar. He's back with Jennifer Lopez. Things are going really well in his personal life and professional life. He starts to get itchy and he wants to sabotage. Yeah. And he always tells on himself, too. He does. And I don't know why J-Lo got back with him after he talked so much smack and blamed her for his career slump. And now he's going to sabotage himself again and then blame her. (laughs) It'll be all Garner's fault and all Lopez's fault. Yeah. Yeah. Just like he blamed Garner for drinking. She's the one who drove him to rehab. (laughs) Like literally drove him in the car and stopped and got Jack in the box on the way. I mean... (laughs) So we talked about this on Zoom, and Aida opens by saying that J-Lo is probably going to break up with Ben. And after she said that, there was that story that J-Lo was pissed at Ben. But I don't think she's going to break up with him. But anyway, here's that segment. No, I think she's going to cut him loose soon. What he said about his marriage made him sound so dumb. That's not good for J-Lo's look. Terribly unkind. He was so mean. I mean, all you have to say is, you know, we just weren't right for each other, and we've both found someone else, and we're happy now. Like... How hard is that to say? But like jokes on him because there was a time where people would take that and be like, oh, Jennifer Garner. Oh, but now everybody's looking at him and being like, you look like the ass. Well, he acts like he started drinking when he got married. And it was like you were in rehab before you even got married. She was driving you literally rehab after you guys had separated and now it was because you were miserable with her that caused your drinking. And Jennifer Garner has not said anything. That's what I was about to say. And the fact that she hasn't said anything about him makes it even worse. Yeah, and it's like Karen and April were saying, Jennifer Garner is looking really good here. Like, she's just keeping her mouth shut. I mean, she knows how to play this. And oh, she yeah. doesn't have to say anything. She knows that she can just let Ben self-destruct and she'll still be golden. But considering everything she's dealt with, with his bullshit, she's barely said anything. Oh, for sure. All right. Do you want to talk about our favorite stories of 2021? Yeah, sure. Like, just as a preface, there were obviously tons of like huge stories this year. We just wanted to talk about some of the fun stories and stories that maybe fell through the cracks because of the bigger stuff. Okay. That was just my idea of trying to focus on a couple of stories that kind of disappeared for the last six months. Yeah. One of my stories was the Keenwell Institute. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Starting in June of this year, Kensington Palace and Kate, they started hyping that Kate had this big, mysterious project coming she was going to do a major announcement and how she's going to work to elevate the importance of early childhood and continue this conversation on this vital issue the hype just came out of nowhere i mean obviously she's been working with early years for a while all of a sudden she had this huge thing to announce and lord haig was chiming in about how it was so important They dropped this, like, professionally done commercial. Someone who knew what they were doing put together a commercial, and it involved Martin Luther King Jr., Malala, and Nelson Mandela. I totally (laughs) forgot about that. That was insane. It was to launch Kate's big new project, which was called Big Change Starts Small. And Big Change Starts Small was her essay slash statement slash research study that was part of her Keenwell Institute, which was the new thing, the new announcement of the Royal Foundation Center for Early Childhood. Yeah. A research center that was part of the Royal Foundation 
housed in Kensington Palace. So basically, it's just some guy's desk in Kensington Palace, and that's the research institute. And they had an opening for it and everything. Yeah. But they didn't show it. <laughs> it's just busy work. It was just an excuse for her to have a commercial and have everyone talk about how she's very keen about early years and she's very credible at what being a professional early years researcher so we didn't hear about this royal foundation center for early childhood again but she did a couple of events with real researchers and then the researchers like talked up she asked good questions yeah. she seems like she repeated what yes. i told her like that was the crux of what they said about her it was ridiculous yes. And that's it. She did this huge thing for a month of, you know, this is my big new thing. And then we haven't heard about it since June. Yeah, except for her going to the other things and then being told how smart she was. Yeah, but that was for different projects. That was Kate highlighting some research that was being developed at an actual university. That was not part of yeah. her institute. She's just going to take credit for that shit. That's all she She's was doing. She's the lead researcher yeah. <laughs> at the institute. Okay. The second story I wanted to highlight was Sophie, the Countess of Wessex. And Sophie's been trying to make Fetch happen since last year. <laughs> Ever since Meghan and Harry left, Sophie's been trying to push herself forward as a replacement. And no one has been buying it except for the Queen. Apparently, the Queen does genuinely adore her. Okay. No one else is like, hey, let's have Sophie be a senior royal and take on all this work. And then Sophie went into overdrive this year, especially right after Prince Philip passed away. All of a sudden, Sophie was giving interviews and she was like going on a grief tour. And that was when she and Edward did that bonkers interview in The Telegraph, I think, where they were oh, talking trash about Oprah and how no one in England knows Oprah or they only know her as a talk show host. And there are like pictures of her at Oprah's yeah. <laughs> school. <laughs> There's pictures of Sophie at Oprah's school. Yeah. And I mean, it was just insane how much she wanted publicity right after Philip died. Oh, they kept saying it's what Philip would have yeah. wanted for them to be. I remember that. <laughs> I remember that. And part of it was about how Edward thought he was going to become Duke of Edinburgh. That's what. Philip and the Queen had promised them that they would get those titles. And, that and then Prince Charles was like, no, you're not getting the titles. And by the way, you need to stop going on this promotional tour after I mean, Philip's death. We assume that happened. We don't know. He let the message go out there that he did not appreciate how public Sophie and Edward were being. And it was mostly Sophie. It wasn't even Edward yeah. really pushing himself out there. It was Sophie, like, telling everyone that she was super important and she had the queen's ear. Uh, she really disappeared in recent months, too. All of a sudden, she's she not telling everyone that she's the best and that <laughs> it's what Philip would have wanted her. <laughs> wanted. I like what she did around menopause. That was good. And she worked with Hello Magazine, too, because they did a workplace pledge for employers to have more awareness and accommodation for women in menopause. That was good. But, yeah, that's her lane. Yeah. You know, and she was overstepping. with. <laughs> she was trying to push herself forward as the replacement for Harry and Meghan. <laughs> and they don't want Harry and Meghan to be replaced either because they don't want anybody thinking they're the superstar. Yeah, Sophie thought she was a superstar. She thought she could happen that way. So my favorite story, I'm just picking an obvious one, where the celebrities revealed that they don't bathe. <laughs> this was such a self-own by multiple celebrities. And this started with... Ashton and Mila. Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis saying in late July on Dax Shepard's podcast that they don't bathe their children until they're dirty <laughs> And that they don't shower that much. And when they do, they don't use soap. And Dax agreed and said he doesn't use soap either. And it was pretty outrageous. <laughs> so we talked about that on episode 99. And we mentioned that we got hate mail for telling people to bathe with soap. It was outrageous. And we were in the middle of a pandemic. We're still in the middle of a pandemic. And you're not bathing? You're not using soap? You're not using soap? <laughs> <laughs> and you're proud of it? <laughs> yeah. 
Jake Gyllenhaal did that interview that it's going to be on his obituary (laughs) where he said he finds bathing to be less necessary and that there's a whole world of not bathing that is also really helpful for skin maintenance and we naturally clean ourselves. And he said that in early August and you tweeted that and your tweet went viral. We talked about that here, but that was just outrageous. <laughs> he tried to dial it back after that. But he could not. He said what he said. And he acted like it was misreported in a tabloid or something like that. He said it to Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair? <laughs> <laughs> and he did it while he was promoting a cologne. Yes. Oh, yes. And in the cologne commercial, he's like swimming and shit. So then Kristen Bell and Dax Shepard said they don't bathe their kids until they smell bad. Who knows how much of that was trolling, but I think that was true. And they have a kid's line, that Hello Bello, that has kids' baby wash and body wash and Mm -hmm. stuff. It's outrageous. And then celebrities like The Rock and Jason Momoa were like, yes, we shower. We smell good. (laughs) Don't worry. (laughs) Oh, I I did not have that on my card. I hope we get another insane story like that (laughs) where celebrities think they're right for something so basic. And it became like a total Twitter war of white people. And it was mostly white people. Like It was white people. And I'm white. We can say this, okay? It was white people. I don't care how much white people yell at me for being, I'm not dirty. Well, then why are you rankling at this? Yeah. I didn't understand the thing of telling the world that your children are dirty. That was <laughs> insane to me. Like, oh, I love that my children are dirty. We don't ever bathe the children. (laughs) Because we want to feel rich? Like, what is that? I think for celebrities, like, and for these white celebrities, it's a thing about privilege. Yeah. They're so rich that they don't have to care about grooming. That's disgusting, though. Like, there are some (laughs) things that you want to do for yourself still. (laughs) Yeah, And I liked all the people saying, you know, I've always been taught it's a lot cheaper to just be clean. Yeah. So I also wanted to talk about the story that the vaccines were approved and distributed this year. And I know this kind of goes without saying, but this was a huge, awesome yeah, thing. It was. And it was less than a year from the start of the pandemic to when the vaccines were distributed. And I'm so glad we got Biden. (laughs) And that's how that was made possible, mostly. Yeah, I was really just proud and happy when I got my vaccines. My booster shot, it was just more mundane. I was like, oh, shit, I better go in and get my booster. But yeah, (laughs) it's cool that we've gotten all these shots and that we're all protected and that all these safe vaccines were developed. And it's still part of the fucking conversation. There's still so many. First world people who are like, I don't want the vaccine. See how that works out for you. (laughs) Oh, the Australian Open is going to start in about a month. And basically, if you go to Australia, you have to already be vaccinated and you probably already need to be booster shotted. And there are players. And they've dealt with Yeah, there are players who are saying, we're not going to Australia because we don't want the vaccine. It's going to be a bigger deal in the weeks to come. They shouldn't have a job then. (laughs) You know, seriously, that's part of your job. You shouldn't have your job. Well, I felt like the tennis tour needs a vaccine mandate. They've needed one for months now. A lot of industries do. I think all the sports should have them. I know that the NBA is trying to do it like a lighter, like Biden version of we're not going to do a mandate. We're just going to really be forcefully asking people. They just need to do flat out mandates. Yeah, you can't just ask people. Enough pussyfooting. It's too late for that. It's too (laughs) late for that. All right, let's move on to the comments of the week. Do you want me to go first? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I can scroll to mine. No, uh, mine is from one of the excerpts from People Magazine's cover story about Kate at 40 and how she's more impressive as time goes on. And Tiger (laughs) McQueen wrote, can't wait to read another article in 10 years about how Mutton and Buttons is coming into her own at age 50. (laughs) (laughs) That's really clever, Mutton and Uh Buttons. (laughs) I like that. We should use that now. That's nice. It rhymes and everything. (laughs) It could be Mutton McButtons. (laughs) Mutton McButtons. That's good, too. 
People don't use acronyms for Kate like they use them for William, but they should call her M M. I don't know what M E M M B. No, M-M-B. the acronyms are getting way too much, you guys. I said that on I Twitter. Know, I know. I really hope you start to phase out the acronyms, <laughs> please, people. I mean, you kind of know who they refer to because they only use them for William. <laughs> so they... but they're getting way too obscure. <laughs> Yeah. I read some of the acronyms as I'm moderating the comments, and I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> so my comment of the week is on the post where Hilaria Baldwin says that Alec shushed her over the phone when she was in labor with one of their children, Rafa, their son. And he's not even the oldest. He was on the phone, right? I mean, you covered no, that. No, I think that her story was that Alec was in the delivery room with her and he was on the phone with someone else. Oh, he was on and the phone. And he okay. shushed her because he was trying to talk on the phone to someone. He should have stepped out of the room. Okay. I thought he was on the phone while she was in labor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I get it. I feel dumb, but whatever. I, d- I don't really pay much attention to those people. So that's not okay, said, and that's my... um commentary of the week that's not okay they said but did he pronounce it shh or so she could understand i saw that comment it was hilarious (laughs) i didn't do any work to find this comment because everybody was calling it the comment of the week so i was like all right i waited till you picked yours because i was like if you don't pick it i'll just use the easy one yeah it's a great spanish joke (laughs) yeah Oh, she's ridiculous. How do you say cucumber? (laughs) How do you say cucumber? (laughs) Mas loca, that one. We have very few ingredients. We have tomatoes. We have, um, how do you say it? Cucumber? Cucumbers. Yeah, she's wild. (laughs) They keep having kids, too. They have six kids under eight. I'm sure she'll have another one if I'll let her. (laughs) Well, I think she's done now that she has the two girls. Yeah. That's why she kept having, well, that's not the only reason she kept having the babies, but she really wanted the second girl. Yeah, she's, that family is wet. (laughs) But they deserve each other. I mean, I genuinely felt bad for Alec Baldwin. I watched his 2020 special. Like, he's really fucked up over the Rust shooting. He's tortured. He didn't mean it. You know, it's a tragic accident. And like, Hilaria is not the phone a friend you need. (laughs) <laughs> she's messing with him even more. Like, she's making the situation so much worse for him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's what you expect from her. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for listening, bitches. And we'll talk to you next year. Thanks, bitches. Happy New Year and Merry Christmas. Thank you for listening to the Celebrity Podcast. Please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen. If you like us, please turn off your ad blocker when you visit our site. You can text us or leave a voicemail at 434-218-3219. Our music is from AA Alto, Maiden, and via Premium Beat and Sound of Picture. Thanks again.